Hey guys, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Micah. You guys are rocking with me on Micah's Intellectual Corner on today's history reaction. We're going to be reacting to Napoleon's Great Blunder, Spain, 1808. It's another epic history TV uh, episode. Essentially, guys, with that being said, don't forget to check out my new shorts series that I'm doing today in history. I'll be pumping those out daily. Uh, the first one got a pretty good uh, response, so I'm going to try to get those out daily. That way they actually make sense in the shorts uh, content. With that being said, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Let's just get right into it. An Epic History TV, History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia, and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him, safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain, the so-called Continental System, or blockade designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and co So guys, uh, just real quick, um, this is pretty much where we left off on the last video. Um, and, and in my opinion, uh, with Portugal, um, if, if you guys don't remember on the last video, this is where uh, the uh, king and queen of Portugal escaped to Brazil um, right before I think the, uh, both of the coalition or both of the troops get there, Spain and uh, French troops. And in my opinion, I think uh, this leads to Brazilian, Brazil's eventual uh, independence, because I'm pretty sure they get their independence in 1822, if I'm not mistaken. So, with that being said, a lot of things are definitely happening. Uh, let, let's go ahead and get back into it, though, guys. William held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the Queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed. And he devised a plan to seize control of the country. Kind of sounds like a, an episode of Game of Thrones a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Where a lot of people were sleeping with a lot of people and a lot of people are hating a lot of people and a lot of people are fighting. Let's, uh, let's see what happens, guys. Um, you yeah, know, let's see what happens. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations, and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the Palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne, and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalised by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate 
and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. Yeah, you guys can definitely see the passion uh, that the Spanish people have, you know, for you know for tolerating the, the the way that their country is being ran and all this other stuff at the time, and the fact that now you know this foreign uh, foreign ruler you know is coming into their country and trying to take over and, and all this stuff. Yeah, I can definitely see that this is going bad soon, and we're what only like three minutes in. All right, let's see. Go ahead. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain, and his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honor, they were godless atheists who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. I do know that, I, I do know like how he was saying in the French Revolution, um, I'm pretty sure religion was actually outlawed the practice of religion was actually outlawed altogether. And I want to say that was mainly, maybe, and this is just my opinion, maybe because, you know, the uh, the church was in the kind of the same region as the uh, the higher ups uh, in the country where, in, you know, all the common folk, you know, were just tired of it. So that might be a reason. But I do know that they went to, uh, they made the, I think, the, uh, the cult of the supreme being or something like that. Throws Pierre at the head. I want to say, not sure, but that was. I think that was during the definitely during the the, the terror ages and all that stuff for the revolution. All right, let's get back into it, guys. Carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya, and led to his famous Disasters of War series. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessières at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, Slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Bailen was a humiliation for France, her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted Napoleon was incandescent with fury. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona and Zaragoza. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. Yeah, we can definitely uh, start seeing um, how this war is starting to eat away at, at a you know, his uh, Napoleon's army and stuff like that. And it actually is, in my opinion, it's kind of showing a, a huge flaw in Napoleon's army in, in a whole, in the fact that it's showing how um, really without Napoleon himself, you know, you can we can beat this French army, but with Napoleon, it's just like, it's, it's too much, he's too strong, but he's like OP, but, um, but with, without him, he, they, I mean, we can see what's happening, so it's definitely a huge flaw, and I'm pretty sure they're going to exploit it. Let's see what happens. The new guys. king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a war of independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal 
to aid their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then, four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France, with all their arms and plunder, using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms... I wonder how... Uh, I wonder if Portugal and Spain, uh, you know, obviously worked together, um, you know, to repel the French. I feel like they did, but if they did, how did the Portuguese feel, you know, the Portuguese people and troops, how do they feel having to fight against the Spanish, knowing that they just literally just tried to uh, betray them? Like, you know what I'm saying? How does it, how does that, I wonder how that works. Gotta do some a little, little bit more research. If you guys know, let me know in the comments. All right, let's get back to it. Some plunder using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November, led a second invasion of Spain. Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Lannes' Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Yeah, I know that that uh, that victory by Marshal Land definitely. Uh got freaking Napoleon all excited because I know that I'm pretty sure that was one of his favorite um, marshals if I'm not mistaken um, we'll definitely find out as later on in our Napoleon marshals and all that stuff but definitely uh, we can see why he was his best one though did you see those freaking that casualty rate I think it was like 650 or something like that that's ridiculous all right let's keep it going guys Castanios sending it fleeing in two directions Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the damn, that's crazy, you guys. It only if you guys um, obviously we were all paying attention to the dates, but if that only took him like a like what a month to go into to span to Spain and pretty much do what his marshals couldn't do. You know what I'm saying? Like that's ridiculous no wonder he's like regarded as you know obviously the best general ever but that's kind of ridiculous though all right let's get back into it threatened to obliterate the city madrid opened its gates to his army unaware of the disaster engulfing spanish forces a 20,000 strong british army commanded by sir john moore had just arrived in salamanca after a 300 mile march from lisbon with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well trained, organized, and led. As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps 
and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sagun on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. I kind of wonder what he's thinking right now because, you know what I'm saying, um, we already know Napoleon can traverse that in, what, like, one or two days, so I wonder what he's thinking, like, because there's really not a whole bunch of planning he can really do in that time. It's definitely kind of uh, interesting to see. Let's see how it goes, guys. While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog, through mountains, mud and bitter cold. Many fell by the wayside, as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness. Except among the rearguard, which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, making them slower to load. These guys almost sound like they're the special forces of the uh, 1800s, or I guess you can say 19th century uh, British or, or you know English army. Or uh, sounds pretty cool. Right, let's get back into it, guys. It was fired, making them slower to load, but much more accurate. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos. Rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some say further. Thanks to the skill of the rear guard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris. Rumours of plots and Austria mobilising once more for war. The Emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, Soult's army... Guys, why is this feel so familiar. Uh, I feel like history just keeps repeating itself, especially in this video. Um, I mean, this sounds just like, you know, Dunkirk and stuff, except, you know, obviously, say the Germans, it's the French now who are trying to get the uh, troops and just like, you know what I'm saying? History just keeps repeating itself, guys. All right, let's keep, let's see where, where this is going, guys. Barking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, 
taking up positions on the heights of Peñascuedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank. Damn, that kind of takes out those dra dragoons then. That means that's like almost, we well, said there's four regiments, that's what, like probably a quarter of their army that came and fight. Let's see what happens. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Around 2 p.m., the French artillery opened fire. Then, Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Soult would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now, he hurriedly cancelled that order, ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then, the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. That's definitely where the uh, inexperience in, in uh, definitely comes into play. Uh, otherwise, they could've, definitely could have held that line and uh, definitely could have probably even uh, disoriented them and tried to get away that way. Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards' Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was carried back to the city. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British Army from the dying moor and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delabord's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6pm, dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8pm. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently... I wonder how uh, Napoleon felt about another, yet yeah, another freaking, uh, essentially, loss within his presence. Pretty sure he'd probably, he's starting to get rid of that, and <laughs> you can see why. All right, let's get back into it. Runya, around 8 p.m. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. 
In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground, and two were set on fire. But overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea, before surrendering. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British... Oh, I know Napoleon was pissed about this. That is, that's kind of ridiculous. Like, he just leaves and then boom, happens right again. Right. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. And did he abandon Spain in its hour of need? or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others. Either way, Britain's only army had been saved, and would return to fight another day. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula, and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Napoleon had blundered in Spain but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. If you'd like to learn more about the Peninsular War, or any of the campaigns across Europe, our sponsor, Osprey Publishing, has nearly 200 titles on the book. Okay, right, we're going to stop right there. <clears throat> so yeah, obviously uh, Spain was definitely uh, Napoleon's blunder, his uh, uh, Vietnam, as, as people want to call it. But with that being said, thank you for so much for joining me again on another episode of Mike's Intellectual Corner. I really do enjoy these uh, these epic TV histories. I can't wait to uh, get to get to the end of this one and move on to another one and another one and another one. I definitely want to check out uh, some Mongol history, some uh, different stuff like that. So without further ado, um, again, thank you guys for jo joining me. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you guys on another episode. I'm out. <laughs>